morning. Welcome to the second part of uh, the lattice gauge theory um, story. So um, yesterday we introduced classical lattice gauge theory for arbitrary gauge groups in D dimensions and the equivalent um, quantum Hamiltonians in one dimension lower. At some point we specialized to um, Z2 and what we will do today is uh, focusing on the quantum description of Z2 lattice gauge theory, we will do some topology with it. Yeah. So this is topology program now. Yesterday was a prelude in a way. Um, in, in various ways this will connect to what uh, Joel just told us. We will approach similar physics but now coming from the lattice while he was more or less coming from the heavens from some Chan Simons um, theory. Uh, for example, uh, we will introduce the Z2 uh, spin liquid phase, which he was commenting was absent so far and, and, and things like that. Now, depending on the progress, I hope progress will be slow and you ask many questions, but depending on the progress, I will then maybe in the end show you a few pictures on how we can actually build such a topology info affine system as um, a Z2 lattice, or equivalent to a Z2 lattice system uh, from Majorana fermions, yeah. Um, perhaps um, once we have Majorana fermions. Okay, so let me begin by um, recapitulating what we had yesterday in a language somewhat twisted towards uh, what is going to come and uh, focusing now really on, on Z2. So um, what we had, um, here we had our links, right? I mean, and here are the sides. And our degrees of freedom um, sit now here and you can think of them now really as Pauli operators, um, sigma Z. So um, we have the degrees of freedom, uh, I mean, C2 on links. Um, another important player were the um, gauge transformations. Gauge transformations, what, what did gauge transformations do? They were defined relative to nodes of the lattice and they were affecting the links adjacent by some group valued multiplication. Yeah? So what can that mean here is our group has just two elements um, a gauge transformation multiplying by the unit element doesn't do anything, we can forget about it. A non-trivial gauge transformation will just flip these guys here. Yeah? And that means that the quantum operator that does it is, um, I mean, gauge transforms. Um, let me stick here for a while to this symbol G for group valued. Sitting at N, what they do is they um, form, I mean, you, you have to take the product um, over all links adjacent to site n. I mean, I use this little star symbol for that. And what you multiply is actually sigma x. So you have a gauge transformation here, implies the product of sigma x, sigma x, sigma x, sigma x. And in this way, all sigma z's get flipped. I mean, to the opposite, yeah? That generates a gauge transformation. Um, that's that. Then we had um, our, yeah, our gauge field, which is pretty much equivalent to that here. Um, I mean, you have to put this in quotes. It's the analog of a gauge field in a continuum. These are actually um, uh, sigma z's. Really, I mean, in, in full glory, defined relative to a side and a link. They sit on the link, sigma z's. And we also see that, so yesterday, that there is an analog to an electric field. And the electric field, I mean, um, remember when we produced the quantum Hamiltonian, so at some point, sigma x is sitting on the links popped up. These were, um, played a role analogous to electric field operators. They also sit on the links. Um, and we can uh, rationalize, I mean, in this language here, that this is somehow like an electric field if this is a gauge field. If we recap, or <laughs> if, I, if I tell you, depending on your background, that um, in, in quantum mechanics, the both, I mean, electric field and vector potential are represented by operators, and they are canonically conjugate, like a, like a pair, like coordinate and momentum. And the cartoon version of that in, in lattice gauge theory, I mean Z2 lattice gauge theory, is that this guy somehow changes that, much like momentum operator changes position. And all we have to, um, I mean the, the Z2 version of that is sort of they don't commute, and they, so 
electric field changes vector potential. Yeah, that's the um, rationale here behind that. Um, the, uh, in a way, the, the complementary quantity to this electric one was a magnetic, was a magnetic flux, and the magnetic flux. Um, was defined relative to plaquettes and simply the product of all sigma z's around them. So um, that is a product around a plaquette of sigma z's, and it's always rel defined relative, uh, relative to, to, to a certain plaquette. So sigma z, sigma z, sigma z, sigma z. Here we could actually write sigma x, sigma x. Um, OK. One final um, element of the story, which I will need in the following, is the analog of electric charge. Electric char not electric field, but electric charge. So what is electric charge? Electric charge is something that creates electric, I mean Gauss law, right? That it creates an outgoing radial electric field. And um, this is actually precisely this guy. So gauge transformations and electric charge are represented by the same operator. <coughs> You can call this here also rho, relative to a side n. So if I create a Z2 electric charge at a certain side, I mean, it means that I, I have this, um, the, something in this product operator here changes. And I will illustrate this in, in various ways and make it more intuitive. Later on, an electromagnetic way of reading this is perhaps you know, if not, it doesn't matter, that um, a charge is the generator of gauge transformations. So that is the Z2 version of, of that correspondence. But we will see this, I mean, at work later on, how it works on the left. OK, so that is our kind of our universe in which we will operating. Any questions on this, yeah? Yeah, sorry, but I'm a little bit lost. Yeah. I can accept your definitions, OK? Mm -hmm. The definitions of any yesterday, but I'm missing the, the big pictures. What kind of systems do we have in mind? Right, the system, the actual system we want to describe are lattices, right? So it's, it's precisely what we did yesterday. Hmm? What? No, we are, yeah, uh, think more or less, I mean, on engineered lattice, yeah? I mean, this, for example, this could be, um, I, like I said, I, I will, or perhaps I can give you a real hardware version of that later on, but think of a lattice. I mean, let's be abstract for a second. Yeah. Just a lattice. On each link, you put now a degree of freedom, very much like what we did yesterday. Yesterday, I reasoned our dynamical degrees of freedom are group valued, yeah. right? Now here, our group is, is ridiculously simple. It has just two elements. So on each link, we have, if you want, classically, an Ising degree of freedom, assuming the value is one or minus one. Then we pass to an operator description. I mean, I, like, I, mean, I went one dimension lower, and um, observables, classical, become operators, or are represented by operators. Now, the operator representing um, one minus one degree of freedom is just um, sigma z, Pauli sigma z. So you can, I mean, it's, it's a bit un, um, perhaps unfamiliar, but um, it's perfectly well defined. Think of a quantum theory where your physical condense is represented by Pauli operators sitting on the links. And now I introduce, a, I mean, a few more elements to the story, and I, just to play with them later on. Now, coming from this um, lattice gauge theory perspective, which in turn represented a continuum gauge theory, all these guys have some heuristic interpretation, which in a way is optional. I mean, you can read this here as formal definitions. I mean, we, I will just give you in a second a Hamiltonian formulated in this stuff. But sometimes it helps, depending on one's inclination to uh, refer to this kind of heuristic interpretation. That was what I trying, was trying to communicate. But do we always consider in lattice gauge theory that's relative or is it? Uh, yeah, no, uh, no, I mean, the, the, this is, I mean, we want bipartite lattices. For example, um, people often work with honeycomb lattices instead. Okay. But um, yeah, but um, square lattice is just the simplest one to play. With. Yeah, so OK. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Any more? Okay, so now we are going to be a bit more concrete. I formulate now in Hamiltonian, and then uh, we will ask what does this Hamiltonian do, and in particular, what is its ground state? Yeah, and, and that will be interesting, I promise. Good. 
Um, the Hamiltonian is precisely the one we derived uh, yesterday. I mean, this descent coming from, um, if you think of this as two-dimensional, which we do now, coming from three-dimensional Isengage theory, classical. And the Hamiltonian we had derived was contained just two pieces. Um, one was an electric field <laughs> contribution that uh, came somehow from the uh, dynamics in the time direction. So we go, we um, sum over all links and we put sigma x n and mu. This was an electric field term. So electric flux through these links. And then there was a second contribution which was magnetic in origin um, minus lambda sum over all plaquettes sigma c sigma c sigma c sigma c. I also reasoned um, on general grounds that there will be a transition in this system which uh, kind of is reflected in the ratio or which de is driven by the ratio of these two coupling constants in the sense that if this guy is small this one will physically be large and um, uh, that is the um, <coughs> phase where the gauge degrees of freedom fluctuate strongly, confining phase. And then there is a deconfined phase where it's the other way around. Yeah? So um, what we want to do in the following is we want um, to consider this ratio and, yeah? Hmm? Once again, I didn't get it. Yes. Yep. I mean here. Hmm. This is same. You sum over all magnetic fluxes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's it. Okay. So um, right, uh, we define the ratio R. It's a ratio of lambda over gamma. And we will address um, the physics separately in the case one where <coughs> r is much smaller than one, or even zero, and opposite to r is much bigger um, than one. This will be the confining phase, which is often the more interesting one, um, which, and I'll explain in a minute what I mean by confining. This here will be the deconfined phase, usually the boring one, but in this business here, it's the interesting one. Here it will be the topological Z2 spin liquid phase. Yeah? And, um, but still, it's, it's good to understand both phases separately um, to, to just get the full perspective. So let me begin by saying a few words about the confining phase. And um, so R is much smaller than one. Magnetic physics is a set in essential. We are, in a sense, purely electric. So let's, let's for a moment just focus on this beast. Only focus on this one. And um, what I do now is the following. First of all, we have both. We have generators of gauge transformation. And we have the, this is now important, it's the electric charge operator. Um, notice that the electric charge operator commutes with the Hamiltonian. In fact, it commutes with both terms. So the, the Hamiltonian is charge conserving yeah, in this sense. We have the, um, we have the equal to zero. So we have an infinite number of conservation laws. And we can um, study our Hamiltonian in each charge sector separately. So let's first ask, what is the ground state of this Hamiltonian if it's completely uncharged, if there are no charges in the system. So what we want to do is um, we want that this here assumes the value unity everywhere. At each side, this product must be unity. And this term must be maximally happy. So what is the ground state? This must be unity. This one should be happy. Right. Hmm? It's simpler. Yeah, exactly. All, all links in a sigma x minus 1, so in a linear combination of sigma z's, which is sigma x minus 1. 
Yeah, that, that does a job. Um, this one will here assume minus gamma to the number of sites, and um, this one here is also satisfied. So we go into a linear, I mean, we, we switch bases in Pauli space. We, each link will be, represent, will be a sigma x minus one eigenstate. Yeah? That's the ground state. So, um, good. Now, um, uh, so ground state in the charge neutral vector. Um, that is um, sigma x. The notation is somewhat sloppy, but you know what I mean, yeah? So each, I mean, we, you go into a spin, spin sigma x representation on each link, and um, that will be um, that. It's a bit boring. Now, um, it, it gets a little bit more interesting if we now consider another charge vector, namely that where we put two charges into the system. Actually, I will show you in a second that in the, um, you can only put two um, charges in, in um, even pairs into the system. And what I mean by that is the following. Suppose we pick this link here, this node, and now we want to put um, a negative charge here. Yeah? So what that means is that the product of sigma z's around this, this node must, is now no longer one but minus one. So on one link, on one link, or more generally on what number of links, we must violate the sigma x equals plus one condition. Okay? So let's suppose this link is now, this is now switched. This is no longer in a sigma x, I mean, uh, sigma x polarized, but minus sigma x. Now we have a charge here. But we also have a charge here. Because they have the same. So we can... Um, we can uh, propagate this um, uh, switching, but no matter what you do, you always have two points in the lattice where you have a sigma x minus one configuration. So what you, what you create is a charge dipole. So that one here, I claim, I mean, this, this is a representative, this is a state, an eigenstate in the sector where the total charge is still zero, but you have two, I mean, you know, in sigma, it's a sigma um, Z2 gauge theory. I mean, or, um, two negative charges are like no charge. Yeah? They annihilate. So you have now um, here violation and here. Is that kind of clear? Now, we don't want um, to pay much energy for this. I mean, we want to ask what are the uh, con I mean, contribution of lowest energy in this sector. And now it, you realize that for each additional link which you introduce here, I mean, on each link, sigma x is flipped, you have to pay. And you have, have to pay at minus twice gamma. So that means, that shows what confinement is in this language. The, you, you create, I mean, a charge, a charge, charge pair. But if you want to pull them apart, you, you pay in the distance. In the, in the distance here is, called, is a distance according to the Manhattan metric. I mean, just the number of blocks you have to go. And that shows that this is a confining phase. Yeah, you cannot pull, you have to pay an infinite amount linearly growing in the distance to actually separate the charges. Is that clear? I mean, I, at least intuitively. We don't have to go into all detail here. Yeah? So um, we say that in this sense, this is, I mean, strong, of, strong term of this type is confining because we see that if we put two charges in the system, we have to pay. And um, that is what confinement does. One can actually, do I want, uh, I'd rather go to my hardware. Um, let's just leave it there. If I mean, so this is, in, in fact, it's more or less. Enough, I mean, it's enough for the confinement as far as the confinement phase is concerned. Um, I'd now uh, rather turn to the complementary phase, where the um, physics is the other way around. Yeah, the deconfined phase. So in the deconfined phase, we. Um, play, <coughs> in a sense, a similar game, only that um, the roles are now reversed. I mean, this term is very, very weak. And let's forget it for a moment. Yeah, Let's just forget it. And um, this one is strong. So let me now write the Hamiltonian for this case. This is then oops, second, which is a spin liquid phase. 
Um, and um, let me begin by writing the Hamiltonian once again. A equals minus lambda product over sigma z, sigma z, z, sigma z. So that is our Hamiltonian, now purely magnetic. We can later add a, a perturbation of this type, but um, we don't do this for a moment. I want to add one more term to the Hamiltonian, and that is the following. Um, we, we are interested in the ground state of this beast. Yeah? But when we say the ground state, there is actually not a the ground state because we have gauge transformations. Gauge transformations typically change states. What we are interested in particular is a very, I mean, a nice and physically meaningful ground state, which is gauge invariant, which does not change under gauge transformations. Yeah? So that we, we will seek for that, and I will, I will construct it explicitly. It's, and it's done just by picture drawing. Now, we can always, um, in, I mean, impose this as an extraneous co condition. I mean, compute a ground state and then, uh, I mean, ask for, for gauge invariants. But another way of doing that is to add a second term to the Hamiltonian, which is just the generator of gauge transformations. Sigma x, sigma x. So, um, if this guy here, for all sides, assumes the value 1, so this, this piece here, which generates gauge transformation, doesn't change our state, then we have a gauge invariant state. So we can um, simply enforce this by um, adding a strong constant lambda prime here and simply requiring that our state be a ground state relative to both. And then we have gauge invariance built in. Now, this architecture here is quite remarkable. And um, this is an example, in fact, it's the simplest example of a family of Hamiltonians known as stabilizer Hamiltonians. So this is, an, this is a cycle mark now, which I'm making, but it connects to what Joel has been saying, telling us. This is a stabilizer Hamiltonian. What are stabilizer Hamiltonians? Stabilizer Hamiltonians are um, defined on lattices, I mean, I, let, let's say bipartite lattices. And um, they always have the following architecture. This is the defining set of conditions for this class of Hamiltonians. They contain a sum over plaquette terms, which are often written as B, I mean operators. In our case, this is the operator. Plus another term of sums, which are defined at the stars, I mean, which uh, operate on the links emanating from sides times vertex operators, subject to the following conditions. Um, all BPs commute among themselves. You can see this here explicitly. All APs also commute among themselves. I mean, they commute among them. The somewhat non-trivial statement is that they also commute relative to each other. So all Bs commute with all As. And you can see that here. Um, you can see, work it out explicitly if you take any, any of these guys and any of those, they will commute. And the reason is that essentially you always have two sigma axes appearing at most, an even number appearing here. So you can work it out, it's, it's easy. They all commute. So you have a class of Hamiltonians which has hardwired into it an infinite number of symmetries or conservation laws. Yeah? It's very strong. And I mean, this high degree of commutativity implies exact solvability for the ground states, no matter how these operators are constructed, if only they satisfy these two conditions. Now, why is this interesting? It's interesting because there is a hypothesis, and I think it's, I don't know if it's more than a hypothesis, but let's call it theory um, in the air, that um, all ground states of gapped two-dimensional topological bosonic quantum matter, all of them, um, are ground states of those Ham Hamiltonians of this type. Yeah. So in, there are versions of this which are significantly more complicated than that one here. And each of them represents a gapped um, topological phase of matter. So that's the uh, famous work of uh, Levin and Venn, which um, did this. So um, this is a simple, I mean, Gini pick example of a, of a stabilizer called Hamiltonian. Second, not only do they that, I mean, because they, you have this high level of commutativity, the ground states can be worked out explicitly. So that's um, interesting. Yeah. 
I don't know. Maybe not. I, the examples I know are usually defined on hexagonal lattices. I'm not sure that I know what I'm talking about there. But yeah. Tri yeah, trivalent, but bipartite. I mean, I mean, it means, no, then, um, I mean, nested. So you have to, uh, an A sub lattice and a B sub lattice. I think that is a good thing to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not so important for me. I mean, it just. Yeah. Yep. Huh? Yeah, Karel, Karel, yeah, yeah, true. Yes. No, I, I don't want to oversell it, but it's, it's a very powerful class of Hamiltonians. That's what I want to make. And uh, they have beautiful properties. And um, now we, we just exemplify this on the simplest case of the this Hamiltonian, which, by the way, is known as the Tory code Hamiltonian. Yeah, this, and the term code indicates that there is some info physics creeping in at some point. Yeah? Um, good. So let's try to understand the ground state of this one. And it can be done, um, uh, this can be addressed in simple ways. <coughs> so, hmm, um, yeah. And um, a good syntax uh, for drawing is the following. I mean, both operators will play a role. If you apply this operator locally here, what it does is it changes the sigma z's on all links outgoing from a node. Now that's a job. And a nice way of representing that is to represent it like this. So this dashed red square is equivalent to the application of this operator here at this star. And what, what it means, if you see such a guy popping up, it, it just changes all sigma z's because it contains a product of sigma axis. Hmm? OK. So now let's try to figure out what the ground state is. <coughs> um, we want a state which h psi equals, I don't know, I mean, um, put, put this itself up to an eigenvalue, and this eigenvalue should be minimal. And uh, how do we make this um, Hamiltonian happy? I mean, let's uh, first focus on this one here. Just change what? The the I'll explain again and then make, I hope I make it clear. The star operator is what? In this case here, it's a product of sigma x times sigma x times sigma x times sigma x. So um, in this, I mean, it, it anti-commutes with the sigma z content sitting here. So the sigma z, if you have states here, the sigma z eigenstates, they will be turned into the corresponding minus sigma z eigenstates. Yeah. Let's see, because um, the anti-commute is it. Hmm? On the, on the, on the, no, uh, the, no, the degrees of freedom sit on the links. Ah, okay. That's slightly confusing. I can't help it. Our degrees of freedom sit on the links. They are spins on the links, and we have operators acting on them. And um, this is what our sigma z then does change. So an up, up spin on this link will be changing. Good. OK. So um, how do we um, construct the state? Now, um, first guess, let's take all sigma z's um, plus, into plus sigma z states. Yeah? Everywhere spin up states. So like here, here, and so on. Um, now, this guy is certainly satisfied. But there is a slight problem that this will not be an eigenstate of um, this one here. Yeah, because um, if any of these acts now, it will just change the spin. So we have to do a little better. And uh, there comes the ingenious idea of uh, when um, that goes as follows. <coughs> I mean, let, I, I try to do this constructively. Suppose we start from an upstate. I mean, um, so this is our zeroth order guess, which is just everybody pointing up. Hmm? Um, now we can, uh, this is not an eigenstate of that one here. And why is that? Because we know that any row n, I mean this here, um, 
not, not with the sum. I mean, these are the local charge operators which are equivalent to the gauge operators. Anyone acting on, on, on the spin up state will not be equal to the state. Instead, what it will do, I mean, if we label our up state as just, I mean, like this, all, I mean, this is now meant to be the up state, yeah? Rho n will just add such a square and it's no longer equal to the state. But we know something very important. Our Hamiltonian commutes with rho n. Yeah? That, 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 that is a good thing to have. So um, we can use this commutativity, and that's now Wendt's ingenious idea, which is sort of inspired by superconductivity, if you want. Let's construct a state, which I cannot write in full glory. I mean, one could, but that would be three lines. I, I, yeah, it's, but the idea is, is pathetically, no, it's quite simple. Um, we, we construct now a state, which is a sum, a big, big sum, where you do what? <coughs> you take rho n, rho m, rho n, in all possible orders. So you take the equal weight sum of all possible combinations of rows you can form on the lattice, and um, you let them all act on the spin-up polarized state, and you write down this state. You just do it, yeah? And now you have the following two properties. Number one, because the Hamiltonian commutes with all of those, it's still an um, eigenstate of that one here with the maximal negative eigenvalue. But importantly, you have a second condition. If you act, act now with another row on this, because this is already the full linear combination of all of them, the state doesn't change. Yeah? So that is, this is what is called, uh, I mean, a string net condensate or loop condensate. The, the pictorial way of representing that is the ground state is the linear combination of all possible applications of row operators, like here and here. I mean, this would be one representative and you sum over all of them. So, and, and they all contain here, I mean, each term in the sum contains a particular pattern of dashed squares. And you just sum over all of them. It's, in a way, it's a condensate of loops. If you think of these guys here as loops, it's, condensate means equal weight superposition. And that I claim is a unique gauge invariant, the modulo statement which I'll make in a second, but it's the almost unique ground state of the system. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So you, you dream up a row, I want row here, 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 and here. I, I let them act, and I have to act with all of them. I sum over all of them indiscriminately, and that's the ground state. Is that, it's a little bit subtle, but is that clear? Yeah? And so it's, if you do something else, what has to happen? You need that the rows one. Yeah, it does. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Thank you. It's, very, it's, it's important part of the construction. I hope nobody would notice, but uh, yeah, rho n squared equals one, so um, I, so they square to square to one, and that that's actually required. I mean, they, they cannot square to something crazy, and that's why I get away here with. I mean, if you want, I can put here real. I, I have to normalize the state, yeah, which up to normalization, that's um, the same coefficient uh, does the trick. Hmm? So that is an uh, it, and. Um, that state, I mean, you can smell it, is, um, is, will not be short range entangled. I mean, it's really a massively correlated state over um, the entire system. And it, well, it has the signatures of a loop condensate or string net condensate. And um, I want to show now in the following that there is now topology in this state. Okay, let's see. Hmm? The sum is over something I cannot write. Um, uh, some is think of all possible combinations of these guys. I mean, for a small lattice, we could um, say if we have a baby lattice. Hmm? Oh, we do the counting in a second when we do the. Um, we have as many rows as you have nodes in the lattice. Huh? And that's actually, yeah, thank you for making this comment because that gets me to the next point. I ask uh, is this state unique or not? Uh, so, is there degeneracy? Maybe. Okay, so um, it looks like this is a unique prescription, but there is a subtle non-uniqueness in it, which I want to work out in the following. And uh, that subtle non-uniqueness is very important um, in connection with topological quantum computation in 
um, in this game. So um, let's try, let's ask the question, is psi unique? And um, there are different ways of um, figuring that out, and I give you two, I mean the two most important ones in fact. One is just by doing some counting. And the other one is by explicit construction. I will construct actually different states in this category. And there are not many. They are very few, but they are, um, in fact, um, they are not all the same. And um, to answer this question first by counting, I do the following. I put my system onto a torus. Yeah? Let, let's wrap this up, this lattice, onto a torus to impose. Uh, we don't want to mess with boundary, so we do periodic boundary conditions. So consider um, the lattice on a torus. And the simplest, the baby torus I can draw um, in this is just a box. So um, what I mean by that, so this is a baby, I mean, you, you should focus on the surface, right? It's pla plaquettes here. We have these um, six plaquettes. Now wrapping around um, an, a, a box, I mean, a three-dimensional topologically trivial volume. And um, now let's ask whether the ground state is unique by doing the following. We, we just compare how many degrees of freedom we have, how many knobs we can, I mean, in, in, in put, picking the state, and how many conditions we impose in fixing it. And we will see that there's a slight mismatch. So there's a little bit more freedom and that freedom implies a certain, I mean, a small degree of redundancy here. So let's do this counting. Um, we have uh, what? We have um, degrees of freedom. How many do we have? We have one for each edge. Of the, yeah, right, because our spins live on the edges. One for each edge. So um, that is the number of edges of um, this, this object here. Now, how many constraints do we have? We have um, for each vertex, I mean, this is, not, this is now a somewhat pathetic vertex because it sits at the edge, but you, you can imagine if we make this, uh, I mean, uh, if we make this a large system, we, can, we have simply edges, and most edges will have, excuse me, vertices. Most vertices will, have, uh, will connect to four, four links. But regardless, for each vertex, we have one condition, and that is this. Um, charge this gauge condition here. It, this must be, we, we impose that this product for each vertex, we impose it takes a certain number. That's a constraint. So how many constraints do we have here? Constraints. As many as we have vertices. Except for, there's a slight, this is slightly too pessimistic. In fact, it's vertex minus one. Because um, this here implies a charge neutrality condition locally. We always have global charge neutrality no matter what we do in the system. And if, if you think a little bit about it, you have minus one um, act active condition here. Not so important, but here um, edges and vertices minus one. We have one more set of constraints. We require that the plaquette flux always also assumes a certain value. That is this term. So we have as many, I mean, uh, another set of constraints which, which counts the number of plaquettes. So um, edges, vertices, and that's the number of um, faces. And um, there is again a minus one total flux condition. So that is, and this minus this minus this. Now, is the number of, um, is, is the degree of redundancy I have in picking the ground state? And um, if you see that E minus V minus F, anybody knows what that is? Number of um, uh, faces and um, minus number of vertices plus number of edges. Uh, the it's the Euler characteristic. It's the Euler characteristic of the manifold on, on which you are sitting. So that's the first indication that some topology is going on. The ground state degeneracy is effectively set by the Euler characteristic. So if, if we did, if we had a torus with two handles, our counting here would be subtly modified, but it would be still E minus F minus um, E minus V minus F would assume a slightly different number, but it, this number is topological. So we can actually now, um, we can, um, 
write this down as follows. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, we have um, minus f plus e minus v um, minus 2. That is the qubit, I know I'm using qubit language. So this is the plus minus 1 degree of redundancy. Um, of uh, redundancy. Then, see? Yes, and um, we also know that um, this here is um, minus the Euler characteristic. Okay. And um, another thing we know is that um, the Euler characteristic is twice minus 2g, and this is the genus of the manifold of surface. And if you put this, um, these numbers here together, I always get it wrong when I do it. I mean, I always make a mistake, a factor of two or so, but <laughs> um, you can do it in, in one line, and if you pay attention, then you realize that the, there is a ground state degeneracy, which is... Um, 2 to the power 2g. So 2 to the power twice the genus of the manifold on which you are sitting is the ground state degeneracy from this way of counting. What this does not tell us is how do these ground states actually differ from each other physically, but this is what I come to next. Yeah? We, but this is what we can infer here from this counting. Clear? Yeah? So let's now, uh, let's now try to actually construct, uh, I mean, ask how, how do these different states differ. I mean, this um, prescription here I gave you looked seemingly unique, but um, I want to show that in this category of string nets which we just built, there are um, different states and they differ according to the genus of the surface on which you are. And that's very easy to understand in the following way. Um, we consider again this lattice here, and I will now build an operator which acts within the ground state space, but distinguishes between different ground states. And how is it built? It's done as follows. Um, I take, I do the following, I pick one of these lines here, and I build the product of all sigma z's. Yeah. So I can write down something like, um, um, let me do this here. Sigma Z A and A equals one or two, depending on whether we go this way, oops, or that way. And you can pick any of these lines, but we are, let's assume we are on a torus, yeah? So we, we take any representative. This is A equals one, A equals two, and I just, Build the product of all the commodities. Okay. Now, um, in for any state, I mean, of we, we consider now. Um, I, let, let me just write it. I mean, product over links a of um, sigma c. And um, <clears throat> what I want to. Um, Tell now is that the ground state in, within this ground space, yeah, we can distinguish between two types of, of states, namely those where this product here is one and another one where it's minus one. Now that makes one suspicious. One could ask, hmm, before he acted with all these funny loop guys here, will, will this not change? I mean, suppose I start with a state which has all, which, where this product of sigma z is one. The important thing is, that if we act with our loop operators, these dashed guys, they will never change that, that value. Why is that? Because um, if I have one of these dashed loops here, it will either not intersect this line or intersect it twice. There is no dashed loop which intersects an odd number of times. So when I build my linear combination of loops, starting from a reference state which had either A equals one or minus one, and still making the magnetic state happy, it will not change. And the same with this one here. So we have four choices. I mean, one, two, one, two, four choices in our ground state space. 
Clear? And um, these states are very useful. I mean, the, the, dif the di difference between these states. So um, the um, degeneracy. Um, is here um, is fourfold and categorized um, by the two eigenvalues of sigma z1 and sigma z2. Okay. Um, good. Now, um, having these two states to play with, you know, when you do this, in this universe of topological quantum. Uh, topological quantum computation, that's a, a pretty much the setting people want. I mean, they want big systems with a low degeneracy, low degree of degeneracy in the ground state space, which is very robust in the sense that, I mean, you, you can probably guess it, to go from a, to switch between these eigenvalues, you need to do something macroscopic to the system. So they are in a way robust. Once you have one of these states, it will not be easily changed in, 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 into another one. <laughs> And in this sense, because they are large, they are very quantum, they are good candidates for qubits. Yeah? So um, here you have two qubits actually sitting here. Yeah? Um, now, if we accept this as a resource, um, then we actually do want an operator, which must likewise be a macroscopic operator that does change between these guys. So we need something like the complementary set of uh, Pauli operators, sigma x operators. So any idea what could be a good sigma x operator macroscopic changing one of changing actually this? I mean, how could we engineer it or even build it on this lattice? The answer is very simple. I mean, I'm saying simple because it's um, simply to state. Any operator we can define on the lattice, you, you, you pick one, that takes one of these ground state degenerate states and within the ground state flips it in, into the other. Hmm? Hori yeah, very good. Horizontal line sigma x. So we, we, can, we can build this operator here, where we take now the product of all sigma x's. And that will necessarily intersect once and only once this line and will change exactly one sigma z and hence change the entire product. Cool, no? I mean, it's a macroscopic operator that operates in the ground, and it's simple. So um, we have um, the, let me write them in red because they operate here on this dashed line, um, in this um, dashed red setting. B equals product over links along a B line, <coughs> sigma x. And now we have a, a macroscopic I mean, macroscopic Pauli algebra, macroscopically defined within the ground state space of these uh, spring net states to work with. And um, that's something which is, I mean, can be a resource, and I hope I can come to that. Actually, how much time do we have? 15, yeah, that's good, yeah. So let me, let me split my 15 minutes into two parts, maybe. Um, one is quick, I mean, one I will do now quickly, I just, it's, I give you the idea. It connects to what Joel has been telling us about uh, topological particles and so on and uh, fractional statistics. We have now the ground state more or less under control, so we can ask what are excitations on top of this ground state to play with. And um, there is an interesting class of excitation, interesting in the sense that they are neither fermions nor bosons, and um, so they, they have... Um, a fractional statistics, and they are again very easy to understand. Um, suppose we are sitting here on this, I mean, um, so there's too many dashed lines now, but um, what you should have in mind is this linear combination of, of loop states, yeah, this loop spaghetti. And now I want to um, construct the cheapest excitation which violates our condition, but I mean, very non costly. Yeah? So what I can do is the following. I can do essentially two things. One is um, I can call and uh, create an excitation of electric nature. I create a charge anti charge pair, very much like what we did um, before. So um, I put here a charge and say 
here the anti-charge. So that is, um, most, most operators in the system will still be good with that. It doesn't cost us any electric flux, for example. Here we have changed twice, so the magnetic flux is still the same. Um, but it makes the charge, this gauge operator, here and here unhappy. So you have to pay minus twice lambda, or twice lambda prime for that. So that's one class of excitations, it's electric. And um, another class of excitations, you can perhaps guess it, it's magnetic in nature. And the magnetic excitations, um, there you decide to pick one plaquette here, and here you violate this condition of sigma z, sigma z equals um, uh, plus one, you violate it in this plaquette. And you can violate that for by flipping this sigma z guy. The moment you do this, this plaquette is also unhappy. So you have, um, can have now something like that, or you can carry on to something like that. So now the rule is sigma z here, here, and here is flipped. So you pay, this plaquette is unhappy, this is unhappy. Uh, this is actually still happy, that's what I want, I mean, because here you do it twice. Here this is also happy, but this is unhappy. So you pay only for the endpoints. For the endpoints you pay, the moment you created these, uh, these guys, they can drift away. You pay twice the price for a, a violated plaquette. So these are the magnetic excitations in the system. Yeah? Electric and magnetic. So let me phrase this again. The lowest excitations on top of the ground state cost energy twice lambda or um, twice lambda prime, respectively. They are deconfined. They, I mean, you can pull them. They, they drift freely on the lattice, and you, you pay twice, and they are fundamentally different. And they are quantum. So now we can, we can I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of tempting to think of those guys here as quasi-particles, which are created in pairs. And the reflex is then, in this business, to ask what is their, what, what are their quantum number, in particular, what is the mutual exchange statistics. And perhaps you will not be surprised if I tell you that if you wrap magnetic excitations, for example, if you do a braiding operation, you pull this around, nothing happens. I mean, you don't, they, they don't notice. The same with the electric. But the moment you pull a magnetic through an electric here, so you moment, for example, you take this here and wrap it around this guy, you catch a phase. Now, what would you say is this phase you catch? If I take this guy, I mean, just guessing intuitively. 0.83 minus one. So it's, it's clear, there's just plus and minus ones here, yeah? I mean, nothing else. So you get a minus one. Now, you would naively say that, ah, minus one fermions. But that's wrong. If you think about it, what, I mean, a fermion exchange operation, if you take two fermions, you want to exchange, what you do is you take this fermion, bring it here, and then you translate over here. That is a fermion exchange. For fermions, this gives you a minus one. With these guys, a full circle gives you minus one, meaning that a semicircle gives you square root of minus one, which is i. So these are semion, semionic particles relative to each other. And now we have a kind of a setting where we have electric particles, magnetic particles, and they have an interest, uh, trivial statistics relative to themselves and non-trivial relative to each other. How do we do something with that? And that depends now on your kind of inclination. One game that has been played, I'm mentioning it in connection with Joel's talk, is you can move from here, you can ask what would be a good continuum theory representing this system, and it's a chance time. It's a topological field theory, um, topological in the sense that once you created these guys, there is nothing to pay, there is no dynamics um, in the system, but there is statistics. And the statistics is created by a generalization of um, Chan Simon theories he was talking about, where you have um, kind of operating with two types of quasi particles, and it, 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 they're called BF Chan Simon theories. And, um, but that's one, yeah? Hmm? Yeah, the, the statistics then, um, good question, is encapsulated in, in some kind of, in this business called a K matrix. And it's just engineered such that you um, catch this minus one. If you, so it, it, this is a way of encapsulating the Z2 degree of freedom, actually, of the theory. In, it's a minimal topological field theory that does the Z2 yeah. business. Um, yeah, hmm? So there are two kinds of particles in the statistics. Yeah. 
Right. Or the geometric symmetry. And then uh, BF theory can exist in even space time dimension, unlike transcendence, right? So, like, you could make a 3D toric code, uh, and that would be yeah. Yeah, 3 plus 1. So, I guess I, when you call BF yeah. in science, I, I, somehow there are some differences between. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I'm not well, well educated. The, what, what I know here is, I mean, for this two-dimensional setting, you add time, and then you add two plus one. And in three plus one, I think it's getting a whole lot more. And then you get, also catch this whole fracton physics and so on. So it's there, there are other physics, but yeah. there is a straightforward uh, generalization of the right. toric code of three D. Yeah, that I sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, that something that's pushing now my limits. But I, I'm essentially only mentioning it in, uh, to, to, I mean, this is a topological spin liquid we have been discussing. And its uh, statistical contents can be described in the continuum by a tailored topological field theory, which is of Chan Simon's type. No? That was the message. So in my last five minutes, yeah, um, I just want to throw some pictures at you. I mean, this will be not, no more, no, no, I, oh, my computer. Um, I want to, give you a proposal of how this can be, um, just the flavor of how this can be made real, right, in, in devi with device technology. Um, and the thing is, ah, um, this, this setting here defines um, the architecture of what is called stabilizer code quantum information. So what is that? The idea in this game is to build a whole lot of uh, physical qubits. I mean, each of these sigma z's and so on, they define a, a qubit degree, degrees of freedom. Now, they are usually they are prone to errors you have errors on the microscopic level, the idea of stabilizer code quantum computation is to turn redundancy, lots and lots of qubits, into a resource in the sense that built based on these lots and lots of physical qubits, you pick only few logical qubits. In this case, just two for a torus, yeah. So you, you, um, you, you build a huge torus with thousands of qubits. Sounds pathetic these days, yeah, but that's the idea. And um, en encoded into this um, entangled ground state of this system uh, is a small number of logical qubits, and those are the ones you actually do quantum information with. It's called stabilizer code quantum information. And um, there was a time, I mean, maybe two, two or so years back, or 1.5 years, when we were all incredibly optimistic uh, where Majorana device technology was concerned. This has significantly mellowed down, and um, we are not quite as euphoric anymore. But um, I want to show you, I'll just give you the idea of um, in, a, in, a, in a perfect world where we actually had a reliable Majorana quantum wire, we could build these um, and do quantum computation with it. Yeah? So that's, um, and that's just a, a few, I mean, just a bit of picture drawing. Um, so the actual problem is to find my, oh, yeah, here it is. Um, So let's, um, yeah, that's USB-C, so I can use that. But I have to turn the projector on, no? How does it go? Projector? Ah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, I mean, while it is coming up, um, uh, quick, quick um, uh, kind of uh, background information. Here we have a somewhat uh, funny situation where the, we have uh, degrees of freedom sigma x on these stars here and sigma z's on these nodes, and we want to build them with Majorana um, qubit technology. So there comes one trick. Um, you slightly, the actual lattice you build in, with quantum devices is nested into this one as follows. You um, draw you draw a lattice like this. Yeah, extend it. So these red lines intersecting. And now see what happens. Um, we have di here different types of square lattices. Uh, one, I mean, some have an equal number and um, have um, no node in, in between them or in the center, and those here, the adjacent one, have a node. So if you label the operator contents, here we had our sigma c degrees of freedom, sigma z, sigma z, d sigma z, around these plaquettes, and here we have sigma axis sitting. It's also on the links. 
sigma x, sigma x, sigma x. So you need a hardware that contains products of sigma x's on the nodes of an effective quantum device and products of sigma z's on the nodes of an adjacent device, yeah? And you need lots of them. And um, still don't have a projector. So I, maybe not. Ah. No, I think the projector is out. Ah, very good. It's already nice. Mm -hmm. So don't take this seriously. Like, yeah, my time is up. It's just a bit of sci-fi. Um, in a perfect quantum device technology world, we can build this. And uh, it has the advantage that it's, I mean, um, optimistic as it is at, at present. It is way more realistic than other approaches to um, universal quantum computation. That's what I believe. Um, so here it is. It's a hierarchical construction we are building on. The um, actual code is shown on the right-hand side, and we built in four steps, A, B, C. And let me very, very briefly um, guide you through how it's going. The starting point is a Majorana end state. So this is the end of a, of a quantum wire where we have a Majorana sitting. Yeah? And this, these are our building blocks. And then comes this idea of how to make them with semiconductor quantum wires or topological insulator quantum wires, and um, we've heard a lot about that, and we still don't have them. We can be moderately optimistic to get them, but suppose we get them, Majorana end state. So then comes the next step. This is so-called Majorana Cooper box, and that is realistic. The moment you have a wire, this is in reach. What it is, is a system of two wires, micron-sized, with four Majoranas at the end, I mean, yeah? Now let's do the counting um, of how many degrees of freedom do we have here. We have two Majoranas are a complex fermion. So we have two fermions in here, means a four-dimensional Hilbert space. I mean, occupation number, right? I mean, can we occupy it or not? Four-dimensional Hilbert space, that's not a qubit. In order to get a qubit, we impose electrostatic charging energy on the system. We tell that the system where the fermions are concerned should be charged in either even or odd parity, and that is, again, realistic. You can do it in the lab. And they do it now. I mean, this is... Um, the moment you have this charge constraint, either zero or two fermions, or either one fermion, you have a two-dimensional Hilbert space, four by two, and that's a qubit. So this is called the Majorana Cooper box, and it hosts the qubit. The Pauli operators acting on this qubit are realized as products of Majorana's operators. So if you take, say, gamma one, gamma two, it's a Z, Pauli Z operator. If you take gamma two, gamma three, or the, I mean, in, in vertical direction, it's x, and if you take them diagonal, it's sigma y, for example. So you have a qubit plus a neatly defined. That's very important. That's difficult in superconducting qubits or other qubits. Um, this is a highly digital qubit. It's, it's perfect for device building. Next thing, you connect them like this. If you do that, <coughs> you get, I mean, you, if, you, if you wire them up in, in cells like this, what, what do you get? I mean, the Majoranas can just sit there and be bored, or they can decide, that's the, the cheapest, I mean, uh, excitation you have, they can decide to hop once around the ring, because overall the system must be electrically, we have this charging energy, so in a, in a ring exchange process where a Majorana just hops around this loop, the boxes will be quickly electrostatically charged and uncharged. At the end of the process, you are again electrically neutral, so this must be a fast process, and it's virtual, but what it involves is the product of eight Majoranas going around um, the cell. Now this product of Majoranas is, um, depending on which cell you take, is either this one, I mean, acts like sigma z, sigma z, sigma z, or sigma x, sigma x, sigma x on the neighboring side. So this builds the plaquettes of the code. And um, then uh, you can um, basically connect, think about networks, so that is now the full surface code or um, stabilizer code, and you understand it slightly. We, do, we don't have it. Maybe we'll have it in I don't know how many years. But once you have it, 
um, you can um, actually work with the logical qubits in, in, in ways that are way more convenient than in other qubit platforms. So that's why um, everybody, including Microsoft, um, so this is in a way, this is where Microsoft is heading, yeah? uh, to build one of these guys. But um, progress is slow. And yeah, that's, I mean, just telling you how, how the system is. So that was it. I mean, just introduction quickly to C2 Spin Liquid and um, a glimpse of reality, perhaps. And thank you for the attention. Thank you.